the mailbag. You got the three of us here on the Just Baseball Show. That's Jack McMullen, Arm Layton, and I am Peter Apple. It is Friday, August 11th, and we have seven awesome questions loaded up from our social media pages. Again, thank you all for leaving those on Instagram at Just Baseball Show and on Twitter at Just BB underscore media. And we also have to talk about Michael Lorenzen throwing the 14th career no hitter for the Philadelphia Phillies. But first, we are brought to you by BetMGM, the king of sportsbooks. Use promo code Just Baseball when you sign up and deposit into your newly created account. Download the BetMGM Sports app on iOS or Android or visit BetMGM.com. Place your first bet offer and receive up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if it loses. If the bet does lose, your bonus bets will be available once the wager is settled. Remember, gambling problem, call or text 1-800-GAMBLER and must be 21 or older. Gentlemen, it took Michael Lorenzen over 120 pitches to throw the 14th no-hitter in Phillies history. It wasn't quite it wasn't quite Framber Valdez, 93 pitches, tons of ground balls, but a no-hitter is still electric. It was like more emotional. It, it borderline yeah. more emotional, especially with the Phillies broadcast consistently showing his mom, his wife, and his kid. Like, that was so much fun to watch the final three innings and just get a look at them and, like, how the joy and the giddiness turned to tears at the end. Because, like, dude, that's so freaking special. And think about Michael Lorenzen. You can think about him in a vacuum. Okay, he was a rental get for the Phillies. Um, He signed a, a prove-it deal pretty much with, with the Tigers, but – you got to remember, man, like this is the fourth or fifth time Michael Lorenzen's had to prove it in his career. Mm-hmm. He was the guy with the huge biceps that was playing right field and was better known as a guy that wanted to try the two-way thing, but was going to be the way shittier version of Otani when he signed with the Angels. This guy has always never been taken totally seriously as even a mid-rotation starting pitcher. He was always kind of a, I don't want to say it because it sounds mean, but I'm trying to think of the right way to say glorified gimmick. That's kind of what Lorenzen was. He was this glorified two-way guy that showed flashes, but looked like a reliever and a bench bat. Now he's turned himself into a starting pitcher that was the best rental starting pitcher available at the deadline. And a guy that just threw a no-hitter for a team that's trying to claw their way into the postseason. So I I thought the whole story around the Michael Lorenzen no-hitter was just freaking beautiful. Yeah, well, speaking to that emotional part, from Anthony Lorenzen, Michael Lorenzen's brother, tomorrow, 8 slash 10 slash 2023 is our father's birthday. Michael wow. hit his first major league home run two days after our father passed and now has thrown a no-hitter the oh, day shit. before his birthday. I know he's looking down with who's the blaring, celebrating like no other. Dad is proud of you, brother. With the Who, classic rock band, one of the greatest bands of all time. Wow, I, I didn't see that that aspect of that. Obviously, that that uh, tugs at my heartstrings a little extra too. I knew about the home run, and that was a really special moment. And um, it's just it, it's amazing that he has those two sides of it too. Where like it, I wouldn't say his position player like career was the biggest success ever, though he did have a couple outs above average in the outfield, which is pretty nuts. Honestly, some crazy catches, but it just like, like Jack said, it kind of just felt like pick one at this point, you're kind of fighting for, you know, relevancy at both. And maybe you should just focus on one. And now he's focused on the pitching side and he's been awesome. But that home run moment was almost worth it in itself. I could imagine for his family and for everybody in the baseball community, like that's one of the things that I think a lot of people will never forget. But then on the pitching side, one, what I love about no hitters is that they come in so many different forms. Peter just mm-hmm. said it wasn't like the Framber Valdez one. It wasn't like, you know, a lot of the others where it's a bunch of K's or whatever it may be. Like no hitters look different almost every single time. And that's what makes it so cool. And the other side of it is usually it's not just the best pitcher. It's not just like the, the of course, a lot of the best pitchers have thrown a lot of no hitters, but a lot of times it's guys that have fought to get to where they're trying to get and you know have this special moment that they can hold on to for the rest of their lives Michael Lorenzen has never has thrown a hundred innings or more one other time in his career and that was his rookie season since then he's kind of just been floating around as a swing man two-way guy whatever it whatever it really was mostly reliever and now this is the first year where he's only made starts besides I guess last year but he only made 18 of them 
and he's turned into a really solid starting pitcher. So even without the no hitter, I think it's been a really cool story for Lorenzen this year and turning into the guy that we were trying to send to every team ahead of the deadline. Like he was our, our guy this year. Um, but I can't imagine how special this moment is. And especially, you know, with the loss of his father and, and how much joy that not only brings to him, but his whole family, like, you see families get so pumped about no hitters and things like that. But like Jack mentioned, there was like a different level of, of emotion from the family. And you can tell it's because I think that, you know, Michael Lorenzen's father there was, was on everybody's mind. And, and just to wrap up on that too, I think the only person who was smiling almost as hard as Michael Lorenzen's family. And of course, of course, Michael Lorenzen was Rob Thompson, the manager of the Phillies, because he's just, I love that, um, that video in the Phillies locker room after the game was over when Rob Thompson is cheersing everyone with the champagne and just grinning ear to ear, because he says your first start, you came over eight innings, two earned runs, gave the bullpen a break. Next start is the no hitter. And he like stops for a second and just says, Welcome to Philly. And just beaming with excitement. Everyone in the locker room goes crazy. Lorenzen is just showering the rest of the team with praise, talking about Rojas's defense in center field, just everyone around the locker room, and then just praising J2 Ramuto. Just felt like a cohesive unit. And it's at a good time for the Phillies, too, because they're competing for a wild card spot. Yeah. That's the kind of spark that can really get a team going. So I was going to say my my favorite part of a no hitter is all the camera angles you see of the final out. And and they usually do that, you know, 30 seconds to a minute after the final out is recorded and they show Lorenzen reacting, they show JT reacting, they show Johan Rojas reacting and then they show the side view. And the the reactions that I love, number 1 first and foremost like was his mom and wife and kid who I, I'm not sure his daughter was looking at the field at the time, but I loved the reaction of mom and wife. Number two, obviously Lorenzen. Number three was Johan Rojas. That yeah. guy was so giddy when he caught that fly ball. And then after that, I mean, JT looked amped behind the plate, but how about Bryce Harper being the first one over to jump in on, on the bear hug of Michael Lorenzen from first base, dude, this Phillies team, is really fun when they're going right. And I think yeah. that type of emotion, that type of Philly love that they just gave Michael Lorenzen was fucking awesome. And I'm like fully on the Phillies train moving forward. Well, the, the vibes are in, uh, immaculate right now immaculate. in Philly because it, it, this already made us forget. Like Wes Wilson had his first career home run. Yeah. As in his first game as a 28 year old rookie with the Phillies, his dad was crying and his whole family was like losing their mind. It, this was a, just a special game all around. Wes Wilson, what was he, a 17th round pick in 2016 by the Milwaukee Brewers? That's 501st overall. He's bounced around a little bit and, and has basically just been grinding through the minors for the last eight years or whatever it may be, like seven years. Like, that's an awesome story in itself. And you can understand why, you know, his family could be so emotional there. They probably wondered if he was ever going to get there. So that's another really cool moment in that game. And then the last thing I want to say is, like, you can tell that Lorenzen fits this clubhouse like a glove by all of the things that Peter just said and kind of the moment that he highlighted. Um, and and I got to say, like, Dave Dombrowski does that, man. He knows who fits. He seems to do as much research on the person as much as the player as any front office exec out there. And I'm sure he did his due diligence and figured out, hey, Michael Lorenzen's going to fit in really well with this group. And I'm not saying that's why he's shoving over the last couple of games, but clearly he's very comfortable and has settled in very nicely. And clearly the, the rest of the team is already bought into having him on the ball club and, and feels really good about you know who he is as a teammate because you can just already tell how much they appreciate and enjoy him. And it's not just because of what he's doing on the field. And just to put a cherry on top of the Sunday of this conversation, Nick Castellanos, known for hitting home runs and then horrible, tragic events happened. He had his 200th career home run in this game after R was just speaking about the minor leaguer that Michael Lorenzen throwing a no hitter. So shout out to Nick Castellanos. He's right in the wrongs. Yeah. He's getting those rumors out of here. Gentlemen, I think it's time for the mailback. Y'all ready? Y'all ready for yeah. this? Da, na, 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 na. All right, let's get into it. Uh, n question number one, which true rentals have established themselves as worthy of multi-year deals this off season asked by at 
J underscore Munchels on Twitter. He also said that off the top of my head, Cody Bellinger, Jammer Candelario, and Michael Lorenzen seem like the top three. He answered his own question. He answered his own question. But there are a couple others that I do want to talk about. Um, but any disagreements with at least those top three? So, because the Bellinger situation is so fascinating. So I have a question first. Sorry, Jack. What do we qualify as a true rental? Is this somebody that, one, has a expiring contract or was signed as a one-year, like, prove-it guy going into this year? I think whoever is a free agent next year, like, will be a free agent in 2024. That was an unrestricted free agent. Okay. That was traded. But Bellinger wasn't traded, and that, I think, is the answer to the the question. You know what I mean? So, like, I would say, like, the best, you know, rentals that have – proved that they are worthy of a multi-year extension or, you know, signing a multi-year deal with another team, it would be like Bellinger, Stroman, Blake Snell. Note all three of those guys were not traded. So if we're talking strictly guys that were traded, I think Candelario and Michael Lorenzo are like the clear cut one and two there. I agree. Well, Lucas Giolito could be considered another guy, but if you're a team, like he is such an interesting pitcher, right? Because we talk about Lorenzen's success going over to the Phillies, 17 innings, two earned runs, six hits, and six of those hits and two of those earned runs came in his first start. He's going to get some good money. Yeah. But then Lucas Giolito goes over to the Angels, and he's been really bumpy so far. Yeah. Jack, I mean, knowing Lucas Giolito, if you're a GM, and I know already know the answer because he's just shaking your head. Like a multi-year deal for Lucas Giolito that gives me the heebie-jeebies. So multi stops at two for yeah, me. It does. I think I give him a two-year deal, but if Lucas Giolito goes into free agency and says, I want a four-year deal and I want 15 mm-hmm. per, I'm saying, okay, it was great doing business, although we will not be doing business. If he says three years at 15, <clears throat> I say, great chatting. We're not doing business here. Two for 30, I think is probably what I would give Giolito at this point. But here's my issue. Here's my issue. Just real quick, Armin, I'll throw it over to you. Jamison Tyone got a four-year deal. Yeah, but Jamison Tyone was great last year. Yeah, but Lucas Giolito over his full season this year has been pretty damn solid, right? I know he's had the bumps in the roads, and I know he's been inconsistent. They're they're not far off. That's a very – it's a pretty fair comparison. But here's the thing. Let me me counter with this – the, the beauty of the 2023 free agent class for teams is that they have the 2022 free agent class to work off of. Like they have the past to work in their favor. If you're the Cubs, are you giving Tyone four for 71 this year? Well, he has been very good in his last like four starts. Before that, he had about a seven. You know, semantics. Yeah, I, I do. I do <laughs> wonder if this like so many of these free agent signings went poorly, especially on the pitching side this year. I do wonder how that, you know, affects the market, if at all. The guy and I'm sure this was someone that you were going to highlight, Peter, since I more than familiar with him. But a guy that I'd give a five year deal to and not really think twice about it is, is Jordan Montgomery. I think the way that he has pitched this year and it's not like he's done anything crazy different this year. I think that's almost the point is like. He, he's another dude. We we're just talking about underrated pitchers probably could have thrown him in that conversation yesterday, Peter, because like it, now we have three full seasons like in a row here, one in New York and then or one and a half in New York and then one and a half in you know St. Louis where this guy's a, a mid threes guy. But but not only that, he's getting better. He was a three, eight, three in 2021. He was a three, four, eight last year, and he's a three, three, eight this year. And I, I feel like you can kind of feel very comfortable with Jordan Montgomery slotting into your number three spot in your rotation and just know that you're going to get a quality start, you know, almost every fifth day. Uh, he doesn't bow up that much, gets a fair amount of ground balls. He keeps the ball in the yard enough. He gets just amount of, just enough whiff. That's a dude that, you know, 30 years old, I'd happily give him four years with a fifth year option and not think twice about it. And I think a lot of teams, you know, everyone wants that exciting Rodon type, but I do think there's going to be a level of like, how much risk do I want to pallet? Maybe I'm more willing to give more years at a lower AAV to like these safe, durable arms that have, you know, kind of proven to be consistent. I think a lot of teams will be lining up for Jamont. I totally agree. And I think Jamont, among all rentals, right? If we're not counting Cody Bellinger, guys who were traded and then are free agents after the year, I think Jordan Montgomery will get the biggest contract. But I just got a weird feeling some team's going to buy into Giolito. 
mm-hmm. think he's going to get a four year deal. I really do. I know it's I know it's crazy. I know it is. But we've we've sat in these chairs and been shocked by the amount of money that starting pitchers get on the open market. And it's not like Lucas Giolito is a 36 year old Lance Lynn, right? He's technically sort of in the prime of his career. And over the full season, right, if he finishes with a 3-8 ERA and he's been durable, there's going to be a team out there that locks him in for four years for 60, Jack. Talk about Steven, inflation, he might get $100 million. It's not going to be my team. <laughs> Steven Matz. Steven Matz got four years 40. He's been throwing well lately, though, by the way, with the Cardinals. Cardinals yeah, the gave Steven Matz four years 44. Yeah. Why can't Giolito get four for 55? I, I, don't, I wouldn't do it. But to Peter's point, like I, someone might, someone will, someone might, <laughs> I, someone will. It, it depends on what he wants. Maybe he wants higher AAV on two years. If I, I'd imagine though, Giolito with his history of you know arm issues and you know some of the things that you know his, his ups and downs, I think he'd happily take you know the lower AAV, more total money, and go if someone offers him four years, fifty something. I, I think he'd take that. Jack, let so, me make a prediction for you. Yeah. Fast forward to December. December. Blake Snell just signs a contract with another team. Yeah. And AJ Preller gives Lucas Giolito four years for 65 million. Okay. Are what's what's the question? Just let that sit with to you give you because a prediction. it's gonna happen. Okay. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um but like is that 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 doesn't sound that shocking. That's why it's like I'm going to talk about another rental pitcher that was traded, who's probably going to get a multi-year deal, and you guys are going to think I'm nuts, and I think he might. Here's my thing, man. Like, you, I wouldn't do it. G. Lito can get it. I wouldn't do it. There are yeah. so many guys that are hitting the market that I would rather pay. I would rather pay Snell than G. Lito, and Snell's oh, going to get a close. Back. Yeah, I'd rather pay Sonny Gray, who I know is three or four. Oh years yeah, old. I'd rather pay y- Yashinobu y- Yamamoto. I'd oh, rather pay Yamamoto. Like it, that's the thing, man. It, there are so many other guys that I would rather give the four-year offer to in front of Giolito. I know a team's going to do it. Like, hey, Colorado, come on down, man. Arizona, come on down. You want Giolito? Sure, but that's just like from from where I'm at. He's just pretty low on the totem pole of expiring pitchers that I would give that four-year deal to. Here's another guy I want to float a multi-year contract for. Don't say Ryan you... Yarborough. No, no. Okay. I, I know Lots. you guys are going to say no. Jack Flaherty was throwing 97 miles an hour with the Orioles, and he's 27 years old. Nope. He... All right, just hear me out for a second. We know how dysfunctional the Cardinals have been this year, and we know historically how bad they have been about developing starting pitchers. If he ends this season with a really good stretch with the Orioles, they make the playoffs and he throws a couple of games in the playoffs and looks good. You're telling me that a team is not going to take a chance on a multi-year deal with Jack Flaherty at 27 years old. If he's got the velo back, they would, they absolutely would. Uh, You know, especially just how athletic he is, his pedigree, you know, how highly regarded he was at one point. Um, No, you're hundred percent correct. The team will absolutely. I think he could be a guy and he was, he'd probably be a guy that would want to take that Rodon type deal, higher AAV short term, like kind of bet on yourself type thing, but also guarantees you a nice chunk of change. I could see him doing one of those more than like a Steven Matz type deal, but no, I mean, I'm with you, man. Like the talent he's young. He finally looks healthy. If he throws well for them going down the stretch here, um, Someone, someone's going to take a, take a chance on him again. I would, I'd give him a shot on a shorter deal uh, and pay a little bit more. No way. I'm giving him four or five years. I just don't trust his yeah. body to hold up. Remember the qualification is multi-year technically two works. And then Lance Lynn getting a, a Justin Verlander, Max Scherzer type deal. Right. Yeah. yeah. Lynn's going to get, I think Lynn is going to get over that 45 AAV threshold. <laughs> he's so funny though. I'd give, I I'd give him. him like extra because he's funny. Yeah, I agree. All right, question number two, or is there anybody else that you guys wanted to mention before we move on? Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, I definitely think Jamon's going to get a nice little bag, especially if he throws well for them. Yeah, I um, think five-year deal is very palatable. I'm looking across. like I don't think anybody out there really made a huge, huge adjustment. Has Fuji been throwing as well over the last couple, or has he kind of come down to earth? So just I think – 
we know what he is now. I got one for you. What is Chapman going to get on the open market now? I think Chapman gets a multi-year deal. And and an expensive one. I think he gets a Kenley Jansen type contract. Yep. You're probably right. Was it 20 AAV for like two years? Yeah. Oh. I, I, as long as he's not on the that. Yankees, though, he might shove. I mean, dude, he's been nasty. Yeah, he's been nasty. Uh, I, I think Fuji, he gets that Kenley deal. I agree. Fuji, by the way, nine and a third innings with Baltimore, eight walks, 11 punches, four hits. Like he just <laughs> electric. Walks, he walks the world. <laughs> kind of electric. All right, question number two. Still on the Orioles side. Do you see the Orioles being the team to beat in the AL East for the next five to 10 years, or are they just playing at their hundredth percentile right now and everything is going right for them? Asked by at big Nate two, one, four, four on Twitter arm. I'll throw that one over to you first. Um, Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I, I, I honestly, I think they're playing given the roster construction right now. I do think they're playing, you know, close to the top of their ability. But I also don't really see that slowing down anytime soon. You look at their core offensively, it's young. Uh, A lot of their guys are getting better as they get more at-bats. I mean, you look at what Gunner's starting to do. You look at what, yeah, even Mountcastle settled in even more. But Adley is always going to just get better and better and better. Uh, Austin Hayes has turned into this like like almost star at points. I mean, and then they've got all the other young guys that are coming in that I think are going to really buy them that consistency because – if someone is not performing, you have other guys that you can call up and plug in, or you can use those guys eventually if they ever do it as trade assets down the line. If things ever do kind of hit a snag, Grayson Rodriguez is blossoming into a really solid arm. And then, you know, they found Bradish here who's turned into a pretty solid arm as we talked about yesterday. And and now we know that they can build a bullpen. Like we know they can do that. They're, they don't even have Cedric Mullins healthy right now. Who's, yep. you know, been one of their best players over the last few years. I don't think they're going anywhere. And if if I could, you know, take somebody to have the best record over the next five years, that is, I would probably take the Orioles. I I, I don't think they're going anywhere anytime soon. Jack? Probably Baltimore, but it's really close because Tampa is such a machine. Yeah. And Tampa, like, listen, the Orioles have the best system in baseball by a wide margin, but Tampa is still a top five to top 10 system in the game. And they're always going to be right there. You, you think about all the arms that have gone down. I, they're still waiting on five years of service at Shane Boss. They're still, you know, they've got Shane McClanahan for another four years before he gets his back. And Taj Bradley is going to work through these kinks. Drew Rasmussen looks like a great young pitcher with ample service remaining. And then you go down to the farm, man, and you find a guy like a Carson Williams and an Xavier Isaac and a Curtis Mead who just got up and an Aslavis Basabe. There's, so much depth freaking everywhere for Tampa. So while I think that the Orioles will have more star power for the next five to 10 years, you can never discount the Tampa Bay Rays because they figured out what works and they're going to do it for the next decade. That's why I'm glad that we're talking about the Orioles today, because when you look at the Orioles, it's different than looking at the Minnesota Twins in the American League Central or the Milwaukee Brewers or Cincinnati Reds in the National League Central? Because you just gave the point about the Rays, but how about the Blue Jays, right? What do they need right now? They need a starting pitcher. In the offseason, there's plenty of big-time starters that are going to be looking for big-time deals, notably Aaron Nola, Blake Snell, Julio Arias, guys like that. So they could right the wrongs from a free agent perspective, and they've done that before. And they also, if you look at their young core, Bo Bichette and Vladimir Guerrero Jr., they're about to enter their prime. So the Blue Jays are also going to be competing for the next five to 10 years. Then you look at the Red Sox, right? They've outdone our expectations this year, and they have started to build a good farm. And the Yankees sucks. You won't have to deal with them for a while, but no. But we know what the Yankees will end up doing. We know that the Yankees will be competing, at I hope, for, for a long time too. So it's like the Orioles right now, right? They have the best record in the American League. They have been on fire this entire season. And they're only a couple games up of the race. And the Blue Jays are right there too, right? We're not locking the Orioles up for a division title. And I think that's why at the deadline, when we even got some pushback saying that the Orioles had a pretty disappointing deadline, is that the window is now open right now, but they're not 10 games up, right? They're not the Braves who are 10 games above the Phillies. This is still a race to the finish. So we wish they added that big time starting pitcher. But luckily for the Orioles, they have a surplus of wealth in the minor leagues. But still, that surplus 
does not have much pitching in it, does it, Arm, outside of Grayson Rodriguez? Yeah, you know, that's that's the thing. And But what's cool, and I, I hope that they start to try to take a similar approach, is look at what the Rays have been able to convert, you know, with, with their farm system is like, Either they hold on to some guys and end up playing a part in what they're doing, or you flip a first base prospect for two years of control of a starting pitcher. Like the Orioles need to, to start to do that a little bit. And maybe they're waiting to do that in the offseason or next year or whatever it may be. But they literally traded a first base prospect that they drafted in uh, not even near, near day one. I think it was in the fourth round and it, it was Menzardo selected and and get two years of Aaron Savali there. Like that that's really impressive to me. Like that's something that, you know, that's just cashing in on assets and taking something that's you know, small and, and almost like making it more valuable and then the cashing in that's, that's pretty awesome. But here's the craziest thing about this whole ALE situation to me is like, I think it's pretty clear cut that the Red Sox and the Yankees are in the two worst. And I'm not saying like worst makes it sound like they're in a horrible situation. I don't think that either of them are in a bad situation, but relative to the Orioles, Rays and Blue Jays, like it's, it's pretty interesting. Like I'm not used to it in my lifetime seeing the Red Sox and the Yankees being in the worst situation uh, in the American League East. Like, you can't deny that, right? Like, that's pretty much irrefutable that those two teams are the worst are in the worst spot of the five. But they'll still be on Sunday Night Baseball 10 times a year. Oh, uh, every single fucking time. I, I don't think, like, when we look at the system, I don't think the Blue Jays are that far out of the spot that the Yankees and the Red Sox are. I just think no, the Blue Jays have played better this season. Well, and their team, but their team's controllable and True. I think more – younger and I, more talented no, I agree. like dare i say more talented so like that's why i like their situation better like I, there, there's an interesting angle of like i if there's farm system rankings and then i'd love to just rank teams by like talent under 25 exactly. because that can almost because i feel like to a degree like yes the j system isn't good and this is a conversation i was actually having with a friend not too long ago so i'm glad you brought this up peter like yes the jays need to get better at reloading that system but we should also reward them for hitting big and and converting their top prospects into big league pieces. Like Bo Bichette should be, you know, considered in that conversation. Uh, Vlad Guerrero should be considered in that conversation. Those were top prospects that have graduated because they were so good. They flew through the minors and, and now they're, you know, legitimate big leaguers for them. Um, I, I think that's a big part of it too. Manoa, I know he's been up and down, but that was the guy that flew through the minors. Uh, so it made the system weaker quickly. They don't reload like the Orioles or the Rays. But in terms of talent under 25 rankings, the, the Jays would be way up there. So it's an interesting conversation. Um, but I just I can't get used to the Red Sox and the Yankees having the worst overall organizational situation. Um, I think the Yankees farm is really good. I love the Yankees farm. But and the Red Sox, as you said, has gotten better. But it's just nuts to me. Like this is not the the AL East the three of us grew up watching. And when we talk about like farm systems, how deep they are. Sometimes you got to look at the top end talent, like I was saying, like the Yankees or the Red Sox don't have a pitching prospect that can sniff Ricky Tiedemann for the Toronto Blue Jays, right? Ruth Thorpe is getting close, but no, he's not. Good. He's good, but he's not Ricky Tiedemann. He's not one of no. the best pitching prospects in the entire sport. So it's like yeah. the Blue Jays have a couple of these top end guys that will be good ba- major leaguers. And like Aram, you just, the top 100 update is Monday. going to be live on August 14th. Is there a prospect in the Yankees or the Red Sox system right now that you are as confident in as you are in Ricky Tiedemann? Yeah, like health aside, because health sucks with these pitchers. No, nah, I mean, Ricky Tiedemann, I think might – you can make the case he's the nastiest pitcher in, in the minor leagues. Uh, he, his rehab assignment, he threw three innings and struck everybody out. Um, he's In terms of just sheer stuff, I think Tiedemann's arguably the nastiest guy in the minors. Like, And better command than Kyle Harrison, like no doubt. If he's healthy, he's the frontline talent. Uh, but that's a big if. But just on in sheer talent, yeah, I don't think it's I don't think it's very close. Any last points, Jack, or should we move on to question number three? I don't think so. That was thorough. Thorough. All right. Question number three: Does Josh Young have any chance at the Rookie of the Year now that he broke his thumb? And just a little bit of context: About four or five days ago, Josh Young fractured his left thumb and it's going to be out six weeks. Should be back by the end of September, middle of September, but it definitely puts a wrench in the rookie of the year race for him because it was getting down there. He was the favorite. How should we evaluate the rookie of the year race now? But before, first, Aram, do you 
do you think Young still has a chance here? I think, you know, the, the first question you asked, I think, kind of ties into this. I, I think he, of course, has a chance. But now instead of Gunnar Henderson racing against Josh Young, I think Gunnar Henderson's kind of racing against himself. If Gunnar Henderson plays, continues to just play above average baseball, I think he gets it. Uh, but, you know, if he tapers off or hits a slump, then you can justify giving it to Josh Young. Josh Young's kind of like this baseline for Gunner, and Gunner's like maybe a millimeter below that right now. And he could either go below it or go above it. But Josh Young's not going to move because he's stuck on the IL. So it's up to Gunner. And, you know, if I if I were betting on it, the way Gunner's been playing lately, I, I think he's going to kind of run away with it over the last month and a half. I think there's another guy that could end up leapfrogging Josh Young if he has a solid month while he's out or a solid six weeks, and that's Yoshida. Like, I think you have to look at Gunner as the favorite now and and probably the runaway. But I would still, if I were like to guess how they finish, I would honestly guess Gunner one, Yoshida two, Young three. Because missing a month, missing six weeks right now is a brutal time to miss it in an awards yeah. race. If he missed it in May and June, then I think Young makes up for lost time. But there's just no time to make up for lost time, if that makes any sense. It's like a loss early in the college football season. You've got you've got 12 weeks, right? you got 12 games. If you lose week two, you have a better chance at making the playoffs than you do in week 10 because you have more time to make up for it. And it's a, what have you done for me lately type. Thing. That's why I can't, that's why I can't stand college football a lot of the time, by the way, you lose like one game and your season's over, but that's, that's a whole different topic. I have a question for you guys. If we were voting on this because Yoshida has been so damn awesome offensively, you know, 304, 362, 477, like that's an all-star slash line. Yeah, but he he is a horrible defender in the outfield. How much do we should we bake defense into this conversation when we're talking about rookie of the year here? Because in terms of F four, because of the defense defensive side of things, I mean we're we're talking about Gunnar Henderson literally doubling up almost Yoshida in that department. But then you look at the offensive statistics, and Yoshida's got him sixty two points in batting average. He's got him beat by forty you know, in, in OBP and he's out slugging him by just a couple ticks striking out way less. I mean, we're talking about, you know, less than half the time. It's tough. It's really tough. I, how much do you guys consider the defensive side of things here? Because Gunner's obviously very good with the glove and Yoshida's a liability. I think there's a little bit of a difference in positional, right? Gunner is playing a good shortstop and third base while Yoshida is playing a bad corner outfielder. Like just not only just the numbers defensively, but where they're playing in particular. And I think if we look at the war totals and Gunner has double the amount of war that Yoshida has, it has to be Gunner. And if we look at our friends at Ben MGM, where they have the odds right now, it doesn't even make sense to talk about the National League because Corbin Carroll is minus 5,000 <laughs> to win the National League Rookie of the Year. And just for context's sake, for people who don't gamble, to win $100, if you wanted to win $100 right now on Corbin Carroll to win the National League Rookie of the Year, you got to place a $5,000 bet. That's what they think are the odds for Corbin Carroll. But in the American League, they're telling us it's going to be Gunner. Gunner is minus 225. So you'd have to lay $225 to win 100 for Yoshida. If you put down 100, you would win $225 because he's at plus 225. I think with the young injury, it's really Gunner's to lose unless something crazy happens. And then Gunner does have the luxury of his team's in first place. Yeah. And Yoshida's team might be in last place when it's all said and done. So my least favorite thing about the rookie of the year and, um, specifically the rookie of the year, because usually MVP for a pitcher to win it, they they have to have such a ridiculous campaign that it, it becomes, you know, a little bit easier to, you know, with the Verlander type of situation. But rookie of the year is tough because usually it's like, you're just comparing pretty good seasons because they're rookies. So I'm supposed to compare this like pretty good offensive season to a pretty good pitching season. And I think, you know, we saw really good and really good with the two Braves guys last year. And I think that kind of set a new precedent uh, because Strider was so dominant and, and Harris still won it, you know, relatively easily. But I think like how, how good does Tanner Bybee have to be to get some consideration here? Because 
I think workload with pitchers is extremely important. Well, this guy's already thrown 102 innings. He's a 292 ERA. Some of the underlying metrics are not as pretty, but he's got a 374 FIP and a 357 X ERA. Who cares when we're talking about awards? Like they exactly, that. exactly, exactly. So if this guy throws, so he probably what gets five more starts this year. If he throws 130, 145 innings, anywhere between that, and has a low threes. Is is that not better than a 120 WRC plus and uh you know a three F four? Like to me, it is. Yeah, I think it I think it's comparable, but Ty goes to the quarterback when you're voting on football awards, and Ty goes to the hitter when you're talking baseball awards. Like that's just kind of how it rocks. And you know, like you I think you make a great point because Strider last year, would you have voted for Strider or Harris? Strider. I would have voted for that, Strider because Strider that one was broke my that one broke my brain to be honest. Exactly, but Strider, if you were to compare Strider to other pitchers, he was a better pitcher among other pitchers than Harris was among hitters. But Harris is playing every day, like Bobby's not playing every day. Gunner's playing every day. Um, but no, I I think Tanner Bobby is like so clearly the best rookie pitcher in baseball this year. If you were to look at you know where guys finish on the totem pole of voting. Um, I don't think Abbott is going to finish as high in the NL Rookie of the Year conversation as Bybee is going to finish in the AL Rookie of the Year conversation. The other guy is Hunter Brown, but Bybee's just been way better. Than way Hunter better. Brown. And w- what if what if what if Bybee has a sub three? I still think it goes to Gunner because See, again, that, like, beyond reasonable doubt, it, and it sucks. That's the nature of the award. I would absolutely be in on giving it to Bybee, but if, I don't think he wins it. If Bybee finishes with a sub three and Gunner has kind of this a similar or slightly better slash line than he has right now, and I think there's a chance he finishes with a much better slash line and then it's not as much of a conversation. I'm with you. If like if Gunner has a 130 WRC plus, uh, yeah, call it. You know, that's that he gets it. But if he's at like one 115, 120, and Bybee has a sub three with 130, 140 innings, I, I'm gonna be pretty pretty outspoken about that one because. To me, that is way harder to achieve as a rookie. And I, I think it's – you talk about importance of a role too. Like Gunner is one cog on a lineup that, you know, was thriving when he was struggling and now is thriving as he's succeeding. And, you know, he has a relatively easy role compared to Bybee, who's, you know, been their best pitcher over a lot of stretches, right? This is supposed to be a good offense – or a good uh, rotation that's just been decimated by injuries and other things. And – and Bybee's been the guy that's been holding it down for them in a lot of spots and pretty much been their most trustworthy arm. Like that has to go a long way too. I we'll see. Obviously, there's a lot more that has to, to unfold, but I'm prepared to, you know, grandstand and make my Tanner Bybee like case for the next couple months if I have to. You just want to do that because he's a friend of the program. No, I mean no, I'm, no. I'm totally with you. I I'm no, I was giving you shit. I'm totally with you. Um I think it, speaking to Peter's point. It is a burden that Cleveland is not that good. Like it's a burden that Cleveland's going to be a sub 500 team and Gunner's yeah. playing on a first base team. But, and and also like yeah, he's a friend of the program. I want to sell these Gunner Henderson cards. I have three Bowman Chrome autos that I bought when he was in the minors, and I have one on eBay right now. If he wins Rookie of the Year, that's great for me. I'm making probably 20 percent more money on this. But I want what's right. And You're what's in a right is a sub three ERA. It's not about the money. guy. We are forgetting about another player. So right now, our friends at BetMGM, Gunners minus 225, Masataka Yoshida is plus 225. Tanner Bybee is plus 3,000, and so is Josh Young. And then Hunter Brown is plus 4,000. We are forgetting one player is plus 1,600. Tristan Casas. Oh. 863 OPS with 18 bombs for the Red Sox. Has been one of the best hitters in baseball post-All-Star break. If he keeps hitting like he's hitting right now, he's got an outside shot too. Again, similar problem, not to Bybee because it's hitter to pitcher, but he's on a team that most likely will not make the playoffs. But let's say the Red Sox sneak in somehow, right? Let's say the Blue Jays falter in the last you know couple of months. And the Red Sox, I just don't think it's going to happen because the Mariners are baseball's hottest team right now. And the Blue Jays are still winning baseball games, right? Like the Blue Jays are having this great series against the Guardians. But Tristan Casas 
should not go underrated in this discussion at all. And the books are saying he's got the third best odds. Yeah, I'm such a coward. I I sold I sold my uh I sold my Tristan Casas cards early in the year. Dude. I just was like because I, I had him for so long. I was just like I you know I was I was like I'm just gonna take take the profit now and go. Um, and kept, I still have some, I still have some, but definitely depleted uh, my, my biggest, uh, my biggest ones. I'll say that he's been awesome. I think he has to go nuclear over the next month, but he's going nuclear. So if he just continues to go nuclear, he's got a case. He's yeah. definitely got a case. It's been awesome to see him settle in and you know turn into the hitter. We thought he could be. I just can't believe he has half the odds that Bobby does. Yeah. That's crazy. Crazy, right? Mm-hmm. That I think that goes to show Arm that no matter what Bybee does, a hitter's winning it, right? Because it's either going to be Yoshida, Casas, or Gunner. or Gunner, and like he could have a two nine two. Spencer Strider was a top five pitcher in Major League Baseball last year, and Michael Harris still won. Like Jack, Jack, I think laid it out perfectly. The voters kind of showed their hand. Like we're going to vote for the hitter unless the pitcher is historic. And even when the pitcher is historic, like Strider was, if the hitter's still close gonna to vote, it, yeah, if the hitter's close to it. So I think, as much as we love Tanner Bobby, I think personally he's got no shot unless he throws a couple of no hitters, which is crazy to say because I think who has been the most valuable rookie, you could say Bybee, mm-hmm. like let's even right now. The, let's just call it the rookie, the rookie hitter of the year, and fucking yeah. call it a day, like in like, the NFL, right? It's the quarterback. It's a quarterback award. No, but even you know they MVP. have they have uh, they have the offensive rookie of the year and the defensive rookie of the year. Why yeah. don't we just do a pitcher and a hitter too? We have MVP and Cy Young anyway. And yeah, and I also it. yeah, and we already have fucking. I hate the NL and AL. I, I almost want would rather just have one MVP. I, I really. Was, I, I didn't really. Like, this is a whole. I, we I like that to do too. It. This I is like an that. off season. This is an off season podcast thing. I didn't realize how dumb it was until I was explaining it to a friend who does not know anything about baseball. And they're like, oh, does, do any other leagues do this? And I was like, no. No. <laughs> no? Well, why do they do it? Well, you know, back in the early 1900s, it used to be too – and I was like, oh, my God. You know, so we'll talk about that in the offseason, but I, I'll i make that case eventually. Real quick, a lot of card conversation. Uh, let me tell you where you can ID some of these cards. Alt.xyz, card market – Heating up in the second half of the season, so is the wild card chase. Only place to search for cards. Alt.xyz, A-L-T.xyz. Alt is the only platform that allows you to search all the major marketplaces and eBay at once. Download the free Alt app. Type a player or card into the search bar. You want Tristan Casas cards? Go find them. You want the gunner that Aram is selling right now? You can literally well, find it. You can oh, actually, exactly it'll, it'll show you, it'll show you there's four days left in the auction. It'll show you. Um, yeah, you it's really cool. And then the other thing that's really awesome about the app is that if you are searching for a card that might be really hard to find at the moment, you know, underrated player, one of the, like, if you listen to the call up and hear me talk about a prospect that like nobody's collecting, like right here, I have an Xavier Isaac, like redemption card because they haven't even all come in yet. You can be notified whenever one is put up for sale. Um, so that's pretty cool too. So you don't have to be just like checking every single day. You can set an alert based on your search and find out via alt, via the free app, when somebody posts that card for sale. And, and if you want to go scoop that up, it's also a great way to sell your cards as well. Yep. So it's one-stop shopping for card collecting, just like how we strive to be one-stop shopping for baseball coverage. Alt.xyz. Go check out that link in the episode description. It's free folks. Go click the link for all of our card collectors. Uh, question number four is a good one. Out of all the legitimate contenders this year, whose starting rotation do you trust the most in the postseason? Uh-huh. Um, it's a tough one, right? So we can go contender by contender. The Astros adding Justin Verlander is certainly intriguing, but with Christian Javier not looking like the same guy was last year and Hunter Brown... His arm's probably going to be pretty tired at the end of the season. Yeah. It's not them this year, right? We look at the Texas Rangers. Eovaldi is still on the shelf. Jacob DeGrom is not coming back this season. It's not them either. Even though I like Scherzer and I like Jordan Montgomery, I don't think it's them. I don't think it's the Orioles. It's definitely not the Rays now with McClanahan being injured, and it's not the Blue Jays. So in the American League, I come to two answers. The Minnesota Twins 
have a very good rotation. But the only issue is Joe Ryan is going through this weird stretch, and then he was just put on the IL. But I still think Pablo Lopez, Sonny Gray, Bailey Ober, I think that's still a great three. And then when they get him back. But these Seattle Mariners, folks, I yeah. counted them out. I thought my futures were dead. I need over 87 and a half wins arm. They need to go 26 and 22 the rest of the way here. And they still have Castillo at the front. You know, Bryce Miller has been a great addition as a rookie. Brian Wu just went on the IL due to a forearm thing. Hopefully he's going to be okay. But Logan Gilbert against the oh my Padres. God. Holy shit. Just and then shoved. George Kirby is still a dog. Yeah. So we'll go league by league. I think in the American League, it's between the Twins and the Mariners. Mm-hmm. I would side with the Mariners. Yep. Do you guys would you guys prefer a different team or are you going to decide between those two? I'm going to throw the Astros out again because it's Verlander, Valdez, Javier, Hunter Brown. I feel like that four can just turn it the fuck on and go. They could. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. But I just I think there's more questions with those bottom two guys than the Twins or the Mariners have. Yeah, I, I think I would side with Seattle um, because of the tandem up top. And you could expand it to a trio with Kirby, but the tandem up top of Castillo and Gilbert, I think, is lethal. George Kirby has proved that he's going to throw strikes at will. You've got to expand it. Do you see Kirby last year in the playoffs? He was arguably the best one of the three. Kirby was awesome. And man, whoever they turn to, I think if you go by committee in the fourth game, like, okay, you got a healthy Bryce Miller going, you got a healthy Brian Wu going. How about Emerson Hancock, who worked his way through traffic yesterday in his big league debut? There are a lot of options. So if you can ride Castillo for six or seven, Gilbert for six or seven, Kirby for six or seven, and then piece it together with one of the better bullpens in baseball, Mm -hmm. come on now. Yeah, no, it's without a doubt. So that was the thing I was going to say is Bryce Miller in the playoffs concerns me if you try, if you have to stretch him out. If you get four strong, so we, we see a lot of four inning starts in the playoffs. Like that's all they need if 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 their bullpen's protected by the trio of just studs that we just talked about. Bryce Miller gives you four, maybe five strong, gets through the you know lineup once or twice, just humming fastballs, knowing that he can empty the tank on you know a game where he does not need to go that deep. I I think that those you're getting three and a half guys I really trust there, and I think that's pretty damn good. And then I, Wu, I don't know if you can you could piggyback Wu on top. Yeah, of if Wu he, was healthy, I I, pref, I think I'd prefer him over over Bryce Miller with the way he was throwing. Um, and I you know I'm, I've always really liked Brian Wu. I I think it's got to be the Seattle Mariners, but the Astros have the potential, yeah, to be that because I trust Framber as I've said on the podcast in the past. Like I trust him as much as anybody in the game. Verlander, even even though he hasn't been you know Cy Young Verlander. I do think he'll kick it into another gear in the playoffs. Javier is the big question. Um, you know, he's been better or he's been all right, but those are two guys that I'm hoping would be what we, you know, have seen them in the past. And that's enough of a question for me to lean towards, you know, the, the Mariners here, the twins are great, but you know, the Joe Ryan hitting the wall, like Bailey Ober, I love Bailey Ober, but I don't trust that dude in game, game three of the postseason. Um, and, and I, I love know, Sonny, we have a big but... enough sample arm. We got a big enough I do. sample. I do. D- that'll have a three five. Yeah. Like <laughs> I, I need a postseason like shut down guy potentially. I need the three headed monster. Uh, and Ober is a monster physically, uh, but he throws 91. Here's so the thing. I, look yeah. up top too. the tandem of Sonny and Pablo really like him. They're not Verlander and Robert Valdez. No, they're, and they're, they're, they're not even Castillo and, you know, no, they don't Ober. sniff those tandems. No. Yeah. Anybody else? And the no, AL, I mean, that's maybe Garrett Cole and Clark Schmidt if they sneak in. Yeah. For sure. For sure. Um Rangers, Nash- we don't we don't trust the Rangers that much. No. If they had a healthy Eovaldi, they'd be right in this conversation, yeah. but we just don't know yet. And then of course, obviously, if they'd have DeGrom, they would have the best, I think. But they don't have either of them right now. But if they do get Eovaldi back, I think they're in that discussion. Yeah. Uh, National, National League, League, it's clear as day for me. Tell us. Like can we just make sure that we all settle on the same team? It's so ridiculously clear for me. Uh huh. Is it? Yes. Tell me. No, I'm. I'm, I'm I think he's going to say the be... Atlanta Braves. Yeah, Strider, Freed, Morton, and whoever the fuck game four. Yeah, I just keep thinking about if the Brewers make it, Burns, that's, Woodruff, Freddie. That's, that's what fucking I was good. Say. 
Woodruff is such a dog. I'm becoming his biggest fan. I think when he's blowing 97 and just spinning off those hammers, I'm like, holy shit, dude. You look like the best pitcher alive. And then when Burns is going too, like the Braves don't, I mean, Strider and Freed against Burns and Woodruff, the problem is that the Brewers aren't going to hit. So, but if we're just talking about the we're starting pitching, the Brewers got it. And then if Arias kicks it back into gear, you know, Bueller, Kershaw, Arias. Yeah. That's why I don't just, think it's clear as day, but I get what you're saying, Jack, because right now you look at the Braves, and I think you're kind of putting in their offense where it's like, who's going to beat them? But if we just put the pitchers in a vacuum, I think it's closer. But, like, freed with the Braves offense, like, shit. <laughs> and Charlie Morton, like, knowing how good Charlie Morton's been in the postseason, too, it's it's just a different beast there. And Freddie Peralta, I love Freddie. He's got a mid-force right now. Not a bad take. Yeah. Yeah, I, I if... I think Strider is going to work through whatever, you know, he's working through too. And it's just all those high carry fastball guys go through these rough patches when their fastball commands, not there. I, I, I'd go Braves, but I, I, that would, those were going to be my two. I had Braves one. And then I had the Brewers at a close two because Burns has showed us the flashes of like looking like Cy Young Burns again. And then even over the last three starts where he's you know regressed back a little bit, it's still six innings of two runs three times in a row here. Um, and it, that just seems to be the baseline. Woodruff, nine punches in his first start back. His, As Peter mentioned, his stuff looks crazy. And then Peralta like gives you those flashes. You're just hoping he can you know, capture that on the big stage. You talk about the high ERA, Jack, but like there's also the, the other side where he can go seven innings of 13 punches. It's a level of trust. And, and there's some questions there, but I, I think he's a slightly subdued version of, of Spencer Strider where like, there could be that blow up start, but he could also absolutely shove. And there's a, a lot of unknown, um, not to the degree of, you know, I think there's more unknown with Peralta than Strider, obviously, but I, I think they both have similar capabilities and, and similar weaknesses. I think Milwaukee's right there. And if you look by pitcher F war since the all-star break, the Milwaukee Brewers who just added Woodruff. So he's barely baked into this over 25 total games are fifth somehow behind Baltimore. St. Louis, which is hilarious, Toronto, and Tampa Bay. Crazy list ahead of them. But I think that is a really interesting – sorry, that was actually entire pitching staff. Going by rotation, they are also fifth. Uh, But just with a different list of guys ahead of them, Tampa Bay still somehow number one, which is absurd. Um, But, yeah, I I, I trust Milwaukee. I do. Maybe not to the degree of the Braves if Freed's throwing the way he's been throwing. Another rotation I really trust. We're talking about deep. The Phillies, mm-hmm. Wheeler, Nola, yeah. Ranger, Lorenzen. Lorenzo. That's damn good, too. And then if Christopher Sanchez and Taiwan Walker come in and, and can piggyback. That's that's another guy. Multi-year extension. Like, let, let's compare Taiwan Walker and Jameson Tyone and tell me you want to give Giolito a four-year deal. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But someone's got to <laughs> probably going to be like, fuck it. Five. Sure. <laughs> But that's why I don't think it's – but then, like, we we are – we didn't really mention the Dodgers. Like, if Reyes is yeah. back to being Julio Reyes in the playoffs, like, he's one of those guys where yeah. the lights are on. I know Reyes has struggled this year, but I still have full faith in him. Yeah. And then sure. a healthy Bueller and a healthy Kershaw because of this long IL stint, and now he's finally coming back, and he's got a nice start against the Rockies at home. Ty Blatch is opposing him. I think they'll win that game. It's like the Rockies, the worst team in baseball against lefties. It's probably going to be a nice little start for them. That's also really, really good, too. Like the American League, it's I think it's pretty set. It's Mariners, Twins, Astros have a ton of potential. But the National League, I almost feel that every team that's going to be a contender has pretty damn good starting pitching at the top. The Marlins. The Marlins? No, that's not <laughs> a bad It's actually not bad. I, like, I'm half kidding, but it's it's not bad. Not you bad have, at all. You, you have to technically consider them a, a contender because they're in a playoff spot. I mean, right think now. about it, Arm. The Marlins have a better starting rotation for the playoffs than the Rays, than the Orioles. Yeah. Than the Blue Jays. Yeah. Than the Rangers. Yep. Those are all legit teams. No, no doubt. I mean, like, will they make the playoffs? Is and and the answer is no, probably not. But 
Sandy, that's another one. Like, oh, if Sandy performs like Sandy, you add Lazardo into that, that conversation. And then depending on the inning situation of Yuri, I mean, that guy's a number three with the way he's thrown is pretty absurd. Uh, but you could also go with a few different other guys that we've talked about. That's a fun grouping too. Um, you know, if everyone's throwing to the best of their ability and healthy, but I, I think, I think the Braves have to be that, that team because of how much I trust Charlie Morton as a three in the playoffs because of Max Freed, just, you know, when he's healthy, I mean, he's really blossomed into, you know, the, one of the premier lefties, if not the best lefty, you know, in the game. And then you have, you know, somebody like Spencer Strider, who's capable of legitimately striking everybody out in a start. Braves are number one, but I do agree. It's, it's, it's close. There's some, there's some options. Okay. We, uh, we covered that one. Our next question is, who are the three best managers and three worst managers in the league? So I feel like we've answered this question once a season over the last three years. And I think it's always such a tough question because I think probably last year, Alex Cora, I thought was one of the best managers in baseball, but now his team has fallen under expectations. Is he now a bad manager? No, right? So it's like, I still kind of have similar answers here. Like, I still think Dusty Baker is a great manager for the Astros. I still think Alex Cora is one of the best managers in baseball. In the American League, and I'm just talking about American League right now, like, I still think Kevin Cash, Terry Francona, I know the Guardians have had a bad year, and I know Guardians fans are want to get rid of Terry, Tito, but, like, I still think he's fantastic. Just a so bad team. Those are still my answers in the American League. But I think the National League question, like I still think it's Brian Snicker with the Braves. I still think it's right. I, yeah. Like, I don't think there's that many good managers in the National League. So if I had to give my top three managers, it'd probably be Brian Snicker of the Braves, Kevin Cash of the Rays. And sue me. I still think it's Alex Cora of the Red Sox. I, I think it's so much easier to point out the bad ones. <laughs> Go ahead, Jack. Is like I'll give my whole manager pitch after this. But I, I was just gonna say, Brian Rocchio, Andres Jimenez, Jose Ramirez, Cole Calhoun, Ramon Laureano, Will Brennan, Bo Naylor, Miles Straw, Jose Tana, with Noah Syndergaard on the mound. Tito's fault. <laughs> and they're winning right. Aren't they winning right now as we're recording? Yeah, 4-1, bottom <laughs> five. How the fuck is that Tito's fault? That's not Tito's fault. Terry Francona, and, and I know, Arm, you're gonna probably going to say something similar, but the way I look at managers is like, who has universal respect? Who has respect from players? Who has respect from other, you know, big old guard, old head baseball guys? And who has respect from the media? And I think that the three names that jump to my mind immediately are Terry Francona, Dusty Baker and Brian Snitker. And I can't forget Bruce Bochy. Bochy is the fourth. So like so all the old heads, all the old heads, man, like the old heads, but then like the new guard, it's Cora. I don't know. Gabe Kapler seems to have a lot of respect. Like ah, I I'm, I'm like, yeah, I guess I just think that it's so circumstantial. And that's the thing with, with like, I feel like to properly assess who a good manager is, I need to do like a behind the scenes like just pretend I'm not here and hang out in every clubhouse for two weeks and understand Undercover boss. Yeah. yeah. I was literally thinking that's what I was looking for. Undercover boss, literally do that and just see what's going on. Because like, there's so many moving parts that we don't know about. I look at the Milwaukee Brewers and I think Craig council has done a fantastic job over there. They flamed out last year. Is it his fucking fault that they traded Josh Chater at the deadline and the team, you know, kind of lost buy-in Is it his fault that Devin Williams lost a fight with a wall. Like there's just so many moving parts, but you look at the Brewers, like they're always a roster that you're like, yeah, yeah, I guess. And they perform well. They won 95 games in 2021. They won 86 last year. And then they, they're on pace to win the division again this year. They're 62 and 54. It's always kind of a meh roster or like a pretty good roster. And they're always pretty darn good. And they made the playoffs four consecutive years before coming up just short last year after the front office literally depleted the team. So I think council's in that conversation. I really do. I think he's kind of one of those guys that for me, a good manager sometimes is the ones you hear the least about. Uh, and I feel like you hear nothing about Craig council. And, and I think he's a, a good manager by that 
stretch of the imagination and that thought, I feel like it's always just safe to say old head. Um, but there's so many things I think go that go on that we don't know about that. Like, you know, I, I, I don't know who the best ones are. I can kind of tell you who the worst ones are sometimes. Like, I think I only think, Marmol stinks out loud. Yeah. Just we'll, we'll get to the worst managers, but just a point here too. I think the new rules handcuffed managers a little bit, oh, right. Yeah. With the three outs that a reliever has to get right. Kevin cash was so good at, at moving his defenders around in order to shift, right? The Rays were kind of that first team that really implemented the shift. Now they can't really do that anymore. So you take some of the manager's role out of it. So right now, I don't truly know what the manager does because I know a lot of teams, they simulate the games a thousand times and they give the manager the most optimized lineup. That's why I think a lot of, fans of teams are like, why is our lineup changing every day? Why is so many more guys in? Because I'm like 99% positive the front office gives the manager the lineup and saying, this lineup, based on our models, gives us the best chance to win today. These relievers in these situations give us the best chance to win today. So I think the manager is just there to keep vibes up. Obviously, they have other smaller jobs, But truly, guys, what else is a manager doing in this day and age in baseball? And maybe that's why the Braves are so good, because they let Brian Snicker have more of a run at it. But I think most teams don't operate like that right now, and I think that's a problem. It's funny, too, because it's like there's kind of like a Venn diagram, and, and, and I just think it overlaps so much more than people may think in terms of just how good is the team, how highly regarded is the manager, and and how much credit do we end up giving him? I think Snit's awesome. You know, obviously, you see where the manager really separates himself, I think, is in the postseason. And, and that's where you can really see it. But over 162, it's a lot of managing egos and just kind of keeping the team up and doing those things. Brian Snicker is great. And he's already proven it on the big stage by winning the World Series. Like Brian Snicker doesn't have a 123 WRC plus this year. The Atlanta Braves do. They, they, they rake. They've hit 215 home runs. Brian Snicker has nothing to do with that. Uh, that that's just the reality of it. So, it's tough. And then I think the other thing that we normally do is this team exceeded expectations. Let's credit the manager. And that's always a funny one too, because maybe the team just ended up playing better than everybody thought they were going to play. It doesn't mean that the manager is necessarily some, you know, incredible manager. Acuna, Riley, Olsen, and Albies have all played every game so far this year. So credit to Brian Snicker for being the best strength and conditioning coach and trainer and masseuse and chiropractor in all of baseball. Yes. I, right. I want to say one last thing. Brace fans used to complain about Snit. Plenty. Yeah, Plenty. shut up. Shut up. Snit's awesome. <laughs> I know. He's great. But I'm saying, like, now they love him. It yeah. just shows you. It's just, it's, that you're, you're literally a punching bag. You are the scapegoat for better and for worse. Yeah. Any ideas on the worst managers? I, uh, I, think, Rock, I think Rocco Baldelli of the Twins sucks. I will just keep saying that. I think he's been <laughs> yeah. horrible. I think his bullpen decisions are terrible. Terrible. The Twins are way better than what the record is. Yeah, they are. They have such great starting pitching. They have good arms back there, and they just don't really win games. So I think he's one of the worst that I've seen. Ollie Marmol is definitely up there, but he's going to be gone soon anyway. Um, Tori Lavello of the Diamondbacks, I think, has had some bonehead decisions. Yeah, I mean, the, the way they've they've hit a wall. Is yeah, interesting too. Um, who else comes to mind? I think could you give like, David you Ross like another just like old head that we thought is really good in the Padre stink? Like is Bob Melvin a bad manager yeah. now? No, I don't think so. I, I don't think I don't think Mother Teresa could could manage those those egos, you know. In that clubhouse. I actually think Mother Teresa would get stomped on. <laughs> yes, yeah. she, she just like it just she get caught in a brawl there. Like I, yeah, you know I don't think I am. I'm Manny Machado. <laughs> yeah, like I don't. Doctor Phil's not saving that clubhouse. I. Yeah, man. I mean, bad. Okay. Old head Buck Showalter. Like, I know he's had a lot of great moments. Like, we I think Buck's, him maybe the manager of the year last year when they won 101 games. Which is a joke. But Buck has said so many stupid things. He's dodged so many questions. He said, like, what was it like? The, we don't even know if we're going to be like alive tomorrow, basically, when they asked him about like who the probable pitcher Honestly, was. Like, fair. That's deep as shit. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> like, to me, he's kind of in that conversation at this point of his career because 
He doesn't handle, I don't think he's handled the New York media well. And and if that's the outward thing that we're seeing, I would wonder what's going on internally. And clearly it's not been great there. I, I think Buck like is in that conversation. But for me, Ali Marmol is far and away just, just brutal. I think he's the worst. I think the manager who's the worst on the team who's really, really good right now, I think John Schneider on the Blue Jays is not good at all. I know Jays fans don't like him. For good reason. They have the, I think, the number one bullpen in baseball right now by Sierra, Skill Interactive ERA, which is an ERA estimator that I think is really good for bullpens. And for some reason, the bullpen blows games because he puts them in bad spots. I also think his lineup construction is shit, and maybe that's coming down from the Blue Jays front office. Like, he pinch hits. Like, he he just keeps playing Kevin Vigio for some reason. I I don't. I don't think John Schneider is a good manager at all. And I think there's a reason why the Blue Jays have one of the most talented rosters in Major League Baseball and continually underperform the expectations of this is finally the Blue Jays year. And it's never quite the Blue Jays year. And I think John Schneider honestly has a lot to do with that. So of the really good teams, I think he's the worst manager. What do you guys think? Any of the really good teams? That's fair. That's fair. Because a lot of the really good teams have good managers. So it's not like John Schneider is one of the worst managers in baseball, just among yeah. the great teams. So our last question, because we've been going here for a while. Who is the biggest threat to the Atlanta Braves? Asked by at Brady 2829193. <laughs> also, I want to shout out at Carter KW11 and at up next MILB on Twitter. Um, I know you guys asked those questions before and I, I forgot to shout you guys out. So the question is, who is the biggest threat in the National League? But I think a broader conversation is, if the Braves do make it, like, is there any team in Major League Baseball who can take them off the mantle? Because I think we do this every year. We anoint the best team in the regular season, the World Series title. We're probably going to do it when we make predictions again. But more often than not, the best team doesn't always win it, right? The Braves were pretty damn good last year and didn't end up winning it. Right, Wake Forest was the best team in college baseball this season, and they didn't win it either. Baseball's a weird sport. Ball doesn't always bounce your way. The Phillies were a wild card team and made the World Series. So do I think the Braves are going to win the World Series on paper? Absolutely. I have a bunch of futures tickets on them. Do I actually think they're going to win? I almost am a little bit scared that they've been too good. So who do you guys so think is the biggest threat to them? Yeah, so think about who we've had this conversation about, I think, each of the last two years, each of the first two years that we did this show. At this point in 2021 and 2022, we were saying, who's going to beat the Dodgers, man? Who's going to take down the Dodgers? Like, who's going to stop the Dodgers in the National League? Who's going to stop the Dodgers from winning the World Series? I think now that we're not talking about the Dodgers, it's the Dodgers. <laughs> I don't hate that. That was going to be my answer in the National League. They get, they're a little bit too quiet. And with Bueller coming back, I mean, that's enormous. Well, it's and really enormous. Even then, man, like I'm just thinking about the huge homer that James Altman's going to hit in the NLDS. And it's going to like send shockwaves through baseball. It's like, wow, this guy's been good all year. Yes. Freddie, Freddie Freeman has a higher OPS than Ron Acuna Jr. this season. Yes. Not all, not all and they have that guy that, that they have that podcast host too. Uh, yeah, true. What's his name? Mookie, right? Yeah, Mookie. Yeah. Yeah, they've got him. Um, they have a catcher that apparently is good at golf. Yes, dude, they fly. They're he also, he also the starred in the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, right? He did. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and he slapped the shit out of Chris Rock at the Oscars. Um, <laughs> I mean, dude, like somehow the L.A. Dodgers of all teams are flying under the radar this year. Somehow, and our friends at BetMGM, if we look at the current World Series odds, the Braves got- are plus three twenty-five to win it. Dodgers are plus 450. Who do we think is number three? I'll, I'll tell you who I uh, – this is the National League, you said? No, this is just in Major League Baseball. So oh, World Series MGM odds in Major League Baseball. Two best teams or two most likely teams to win the World Series are the Braves and the Dodgers, and then number three. So uh, – Texas. Your guess is Texas Rangers. Arm, who's your guess? The Phillies. The Houston Astros. Oh, yeah. oh true. I forgot about them. So I'm going to make my Phillies case real quick. I, okay, first of all, we know that they can go head to head with the Braves. They just did it, and it's a lot of the same players. I I'm buying in on the vibes. First of all, I think this team is just going to keep getting stronger. Schwarber is starting to really 
you know, kind of settle in here. Uh, Harper is finally like getting those games back under his belt and, and rolling. Cassianos is a totally different player than what they had last year. So to me, it's almost like they added an all-star uh, by having last year's versus this year's. Stott has blossomed. Real Muto is still Real Muto. And then Trey Turner, like he wasn't on the team last year. I know he has sucked this year, but he's still going to be a two and a half win guy by the end of the season somehow. And we saw him on the big stage, you know, for team USA and what he did. Would you be shocked if Trey Turner hits, hits his stride in the playoffs? Like I wouldn't, they've been doing this with, you know, Brandon Marsh on the IL. Johan Rojas is plugged in. They got Sir Anthony Dominguez back a few weeks ago. Kimbrell has been trustworthy and has been good. Uh, and we just talked about the rotation and we know that they perform in the playoffs and they've got a bunch of dudes. I don't know if there's any chance they get Reese Hoskins back as even potentially a bench bat, you know, for the playoffs. That would be really cool if possible. But even without him, I think they're they're a team that I, you know, I don't want to run into in the playoffs. I, I think they've got a really good shot. And I know the Braves definitely don't want to run into them compared to some of the other teams in the playoffs. I, I think the Phillies are easily the biggest threat. Uh, to the Braves. And and I wouldn't be shocked if, if if you, you know, put them on a lie detector, you put the Braves on a lie detector, that they'd rather face the Dodgers than the Phillies, just because of the way the Phillies match up with them, know them, and have already beaten them last year. I don't hate the argument, Jack. <laughs> I don't hate it at all. I, I really enjoy that one. And I think if there's a, I don't, like, like a Cinderella, quote unquote, I, but the thing is, it's so hard to call the Phillies a Cinderella. It's so hard to call any team that makes the postseason a Cinderella, unless it's the Miami Marlins. Like, then the Marlins are just surely a Cinderella team. Um, whoever gets into the NL wildcard, I think, is just officially a Cinderella, aside from the top spot. Whoever backs think... into that last spot and no one fucking wants it, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So, like, when the Cincinnati Reds win the World Series this year, I'm going to be eating so much crow. <laughs> and I think it's all about who gets hot at the right time, too. And I ain't sleeping on my Seattle Mariners. My and when I say Seattle. my, I mean it's just because I invested so much money in them at the beginning of the season. Since the All-Star break, the Seattle Mariners are first we can mash, right? in win-loss record, 10th in WRC+, 11th in OPS, 10th in homers, 7th in ERA, 6th in FIP, and 3rd in XFIP. The Mariners are getting hot at the right time. If the Rangers and the Astros battle each other too hard and one of them doesn't end up making it, I think the Orioles have as good of a shot as any. The Rays, I'm still worried about as I'm worried about the Blue Jays, and I'm not that worried about the Twins. I think the Mariners have an outside shot. And I'm also a little bit biased because I bet plus 7,500 Mariners meet Braves in World Series. Do we think that's possible, gentlemen? We've got a shot. We've got, got a, a shot. shot. And that'll do it for this episode of the Just Baseball Show. That was the mailbag for Friday, August 11th. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the three of us doing the mailbag for the first time in a little while. Of course, go check out our friends at Alt. Are you all you card collectors out there? That link is in the episode description. And if you've been watching us on YouTube and you enjoyed all the content, press the like button, comment anything we missed, and hit that subscribe button for future videos. And if you are listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Core Media, Amazon, whatever it is, if you could leave a five-star review, we would greatly, greatly appreciate it. And last thing before we go and send you all into the weekend, go get yourself some Just Baseball merch. I'm wearing a Not Gambling Advice tee. Arms rocking a Just Baseball tee. I'm rocking a rope hat. And Jack hates the company. Jack, Aram, I'm Peter. And with that, thank you, everybody. Hate you guys.